this is the Deuteronomy. In other words, uh, this is a promise that this particular state will not be the end of the nation. Uh, that is coming, of course. But will it be this particular one, the days of Isaiah? Israel did not fall in the days of Isaiah. Judah did not fall in the days of Isaiah. It didn't fall until the days of Jeremiah, at least 200 or 250 years later. Okay. So when Isaiah is alive, the various invasions and, and uh, attacks from nations like Egypt and Babylonia and Assyria are repulsed. They're not completely successful. Jerusalem does not uh, fall. So anyway, uh, this was prophesied to the king. The king couldn't believe it. The king knew about the ferocity of the Babylonian and Assyrian soldiers and other nations. He knew that they had fallen one after the other. He knew he didn't have the troops. He didn't have the army uh, that could withstand uh, an invasion from one of these countries. And so he had a hard time believing it. So then God told Isaiah to tell the king, look, ask for a miracle. Ask for a sign to prove that this invasion is not going to be successful. You're not going to capitulate. You're, you're not going to be wiped out. The king's answer, which when you read it, seems humble and seems like a fairly good answer, was actually a very bad answer. What the king basically said is, oh, I wouldn't dare, I wouldn't dare demand a sign from God that he's going to do what he says. Well, in a lot of cases that could be true. It would be kind of uh, uh, arrogant for you to demand God give you a sign. But in this particular case, God told him to demand a sign. <laughs> okay, And he refuses to ask. He says, no, no, I, I, I refuse. I'm not going to. And so God said, fine. You don't want a sign? I'll give you a sign. And then God jumps. It, he jumps 800 years, 700 years into the future and gives the prophecy of the birth of Jesus. And then verses right after that goes right back to talking about that present situation. Now, if you're a Jew then, and you're living at the time of Isaiah or Jeremiah, either one, and you read that verse in Isaiah, and you read that you know the whole context where God is saying, "Okay, you know, ask, you know, ask me for a sign. I'll give you a sign, and you know, you you'll be sure then that that what's going to happen." And then King says, "No, I don't want to do that." God says, "Well, okay, fine. I'll give you a sign. Uh, I'll pick one myself." And then jumps 700 years in the future, and it goes right back to talking about the invasion. And um, if you're reading that as a Jew, back in those days, 600 years before Jesus, are you going to automatically assume that this is about the Messiah? You know, you would like to think you would, but I'm not so sure. So uh, this is something we always have to keep in mind when we're when we're thinking about this. Here's this Mary. Mary's going to receive this message from the angel. Mary's going to give birth to a Messiah, being a virgin. Um, this was not expected by the vast majority of Jews. They, they didn't get it. They also, the other thing they didn't get, this is also important to remember, the Jews did not either understand that the Messiah had to be God. Again, remember, from the time you're little, from the time you're in the to start going to church, you start hearing about Jesus, God and man, true God, true man, the two natures. Even if you don't call them that when you're three years old, <laughs> but you're hearing about it. You're hearing about it in sermons. You're hearing about it in Bible classes. You're hearing about it in liturgy. You're, you're hearing about it all the time that Jesus has to be God and man to the point where you don't question it. And I know that to be true because sometimes when I ask classes and I'll ask people, why did Jesus have to be both God and man? A lot of people can't give the answer. All they can say is, well, that's what God said. That's what the Bible says. 
but they don't understand why. Of course, the why is, real quick here, the why is Jesus, you know, he has to be a man so he can die, and he has to be God so his death covers the sins of the whole world. Okay. But again, the, the Jews don't have thinking of that. Because when they were little, they were taught one thing, one thing, one thing, over and over and over again. There's only one God. And that God is a spirit. And that God is not man. And no man can even see God and live. That's what they're taught. Okay? Taught all about being holy all the time. And that God, God is so holy that they cannot survive being in His presence. So, all of a sudden, this guy shows up and says, I was born of a virgin and I'm God. He doesn't say it that way, of course. This is going to be a problem. This is going to be an issue. Okay? So, as we get into this story, I, I, I want you to understand how difficult this is. You know, it's no wonder Joseph says what he does. It's no wonder Mary says what she does. We should not criticize these people. We should not think that they're stupid or idiots or morons because of their reaction to this announcement, okay? Because that's not the way they were taught. That's wrong, of course, <laughs> but that's what happens sometimes. Okay, so uh, the virgin is engaged or betrothed to this guy, Joseph, and she, her name is Mary, and uh, coming in. Now, this is, again, a little interesting here. And again, I don't know what's more uh, interesting to, you know, fill up your space uh, of notes, but, but uh, I would say this is something that you might want to jot down. Uh, when when uh, Jesus appears in the upper room, he just appears. That's what it says. Uh, when God appears, he simply appears. Uh, when God appears to Abraham, he appears. Boom. He's there. When the angel of the Lord, the second member of the Trinity, appears to Hagar, he appears. Okay. Now, this, notice that this angel does not appear. The angel comes in. This is kind of interesting. This is something I don't know whether you've actually noticed before or not. Have you ever thought about? The angel comes in. The angel does not just appear. Which gives us kind of the idea that the, the angel is like outside. Like the angel becomes visible outside and walks into the room, goes through the door. Okay. Why would that be, I wonder? Didn't scare him. Yeah. Okay, I, I like that answer. That's a good answer. Anything else? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So she gets a, a an idea of realism. Okay. Good. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Uh, well. If, if we're talking a poor person's house, they didn't have doors. Uh, why wouldn't they have doors? Too expensive. Too expensive. Yeah. Only rich people, only rich people had doors made out of wood. Right? Everybody else had like a blanket hanging there. Yeah. Curtain. Yeah. You just push the curtain aside, you know. No, I suppose you could knock on the wall. <laughs> just knock on the stones. Yeah. You know, something like that. Uh, but anyway, so the angel comes in, you know, and then here, here's, a, here's a, the greeting, of course. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, what, what is this, of course, this favored one, okay? Highly favored is a better translation. The salutation is normal thing, all right? So don't think of it as being unusual for the angel to salute Mary first before Mary you know, uh, says, oh, hi, how, who are you? Okay. It was the custom for the person coming in to do the first greeting. It was custom for the person coming in to say, 
you know, uh, uh, Shalom Aleichem. Okay? Peace be unto you. Okay? Okay? That, you know, that, that, that's common greeting then, common greeting today among, among the Jews. Uh, something along those lines here, uh, um, the salutation of, of being favored by God was very normal. Okay? So you, you, with, you know, God bless you or God blesses you was very common uh, when meeting, when going into someone's house, especially going into someone's house. So don't think of this again. It's not as though Mary was special yet uh, in, in, in this case. Okay? Now, he does say highly favored, okay, which is maybe a little unusual. But there again, you would say this to a, a lord of the manor, or a um, or a, a very rich person or a king, somebody in royalty, you would say you would make the same uh, salutation, you know, highly favored. So that's again not too unusual here. Okay, um, what is a little bit unusual? Well, okay, the Lord is with you. Well, the Lord is with who? All everybody, even unbelievers, truly, but especially with believers. So again, nothing special here yet. Nothing new, nothing unusual, nothing out of the ordinary. So far, so good. This is just normal stuff. And as far as Mary is concerned, this is just a, a, a well-dressed guy. Oh, shut up. Told you, do not disturb. Uh, this is just a well-dressed guy, is all. Um, of course, we don't know how he's dressed. <laughs> we don't, you know, all the pictures have him, you know, spouting big old wings on his back. I, I don't think that that was the case, but uh, that's just that's just a, uh, the the painter's way of telling you that's an angel. That, that whether they actually had him on their backs, I doubt seriously. Yes, sir. I looked at it a long time ago because we talked about angels. Uh huh. And uh, they said you've got to get out of your head that they have wings. Yeah, yeah. To represent that yeah. Well, the only problem with that is that in Isaiah it talks about angels having six wings, okay. and but that's, the only place, right? that's pretty much the only place I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, but it was in Revelation, the Revelation they have wings too. Um, so, do they have wings or not? You know, if God wants to show them with wings, they'll, you know, they'll show up with wings. If God doesn't, then they won't. I mean, it's not that they needed wings to fly, okay? <laughs> They're spirit beings, and so, you know, they can take on uh, a visibility, uh, but whether that visibility is actually solid uh, is, is unknown. We don't know whether they, that's true or not. Yes? Because in Hebrews, it says we were strangers because they may be angels. Right. So, right. Right. And, and the angels who visited with God, with Abraham, you know, with God to Abraham, you know, they didn't have wings, as far as we know. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, so the, the idea, so this guy comes in, uh, greetings, you know, uh, you're highly favored. That, that would be a, maybe a little odd, because again, you would only say that to somebody very rich, very prosperous, and so on and so forth. And then God is with you, that, that's not unusual. Uh, for for a, one Jew to say to another Jew, God is with you. Well, God is with all of us. Okay, so so far, uh, nothing real out of the ordinary here. Uh, so Lord is with you. Now then, she is perplexed at the statement, and kept pondering what kind of salutation. Notice it goes back to the salutation, and the salutation is the greetings highly favored. So this is why Mary is perplexed. If you've ever wondered. Why is it that Mary is so confused? Mary is confused because a Jew, another Jew, would not address her as highly favored. She's poor. She's poor as a church mouse. Right? So uh, uh, don't think of this as a, a, a Hail Mary, you know, full of grace kind of thing. That's not what he says. It's not as though Mary is fuller of grace than you are. It's not as though Mary is full of grace as opposed to her father or mother or sister or brother. 
That is a bad translation. Hail Mary, full of grace. That's the, uh, of course, uh, salutation that Romans use. Yes, ma'am. Wouldn't it also be surprising to her because she's a girl? Yeah, she's a girl. She's a young girl. She's not even married yet. Uh, who knows how what Gabriel looks like. Gabriel may look like a young man, or he may look like an old man. We don't know. We don't... Yeah, a strange man coming in your house, you know, you're going to be confused. You're going to be perplexed. Who are you? I don't know you. Remember, Nazareth is a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Remember when Jesus shows up again later on, and they say, we know this guy. We know his mother. We know his father. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. We know this guy. This is the carpenter guy. Yeah, whoop de doo So everybody knows everybody. So Mary is confused not because she's been told she's the you know uh, 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 co-redemptrix or something, she's confused because this doesn't happen. This just is unheard of that some good-looking guy you know maybe he looks like a gentile you know could be maybe he's real pale you know blonde hair blue-eyed kind of guy uh, I don't know but so she's perplexed but she's perplexed at the salutation notice that. The highly favored part. That's where she, she would say to herself, I'm not rich. I'm not part of the royal family. Well, at least the ruling royal family at the time anyway. Whether she actually knew she was a, a member of David's line or not at this particular point is, is unknown. We don't know that. Maybe she was told. Maybe she wasn't. Maybe they didn't even know. Maybe other people keeping track are the only ones that knew. Okay, So she's confused. Um, the angel then said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Um, why would the angel say, uh, Don't be afraid? Okay, good, good. I'm not a burglar. Hmm? I'm not a robber. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a Roman. Uh, a soldier. I'm not a uh, uh, criminal of some kind. Okay, uh, I'm not sent here by Herod and his minions uh, or whatever. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't don't don't. Because again, this is a bizarre situation. This just does not happen. A stranger walks straight into a house in in Nazareth, uh, and you know gives a very strange uh, greeting. So don't be afraid. Don't don't be upset. Okay. Um, you have found favor with God. Now, what in the world, how is that any different than anything else? Favor in God's eyes. Uh, some scholars insist that this means that Mary felt that she did not, at one point, at previous to this, have favor with God. Why would they say that? Well, they would say that because the, the idea is that a lot of the Jews by this time in history were all caught up in work righteousness and that um, they were trying to earn their salvation. They were trying to earn their way into God's uh, favor. And Mary may have felt being poor and with very few opportunities to do good works, Mary may have felt that she did not have God's favor. Now, I, for myself, I reject that. I don't think that's the case. All right? Uh, now, that may have been the case with the majority of Jews at that time. That I would agree with. Because by this time, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the rabbis, all of them are just shot through with work righteousness. All of them are shot through with the wrong idea of salvation. There was only a remnant, and I don't know how small, but there was only a remnant at the time of Jesus, when he, when he was born, there was only a remnant that still understood the plan of salvation. Don't think for one minute that all the people in Israel, all the Jews, all got it. They didn't. And the fact that they reject Jesus and the gospel, by and large, the majority of them, proves that. They didn't get it. 
They were following the teaching of the scribes and rabbis. They were following the teaching of the Pharisees. And the teaching of the Pharisees was you got to do this and this and this and this. You got to do all this good stuff in order to earn God's favor. Right? That God's favor was not a gift of faith. That was not the t- main teaching of that time. So when when the angel says you have found favor with God, all right, uh, what does she understand by this? I think, I believe that her and Joseph were among the few who understood the gospel and understood this was simply a restatement of fact. You have found favor with God. In other words, all that the angel was really saying, folks, he wasn't saying you're special, uh, except that what's going to happen to you in the future. But at this point, you're not special. You're not immaculately conceived. You're not without sin. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, basically, all he's saying is, hey, Mary, you're a believer. You're a gospel believer. You believe the gospel. You believe in salvation by grace alone through faith. That's what the angels really say. In other words, hey, Mary, you're a Lutheran. All right, way to go. Okay, good for you. Huh? That's really all that's going on here, folks. Again, the Romans have got it all wrong. This isn't the angel saying, hey, you're better than everybody else. You know, why did Mary, why was Mary chosen as the mother of, of the Messiah? Was it because of anything in Mary? No. It was God's choice. Now, you could say, well, maybe she'd shown herself to be a very loving, caring person, could be a, could be a very good mother. E, okay, fine. I'm sure lots of ladies in Israel, young girls in Israel, would have been good mothers. Yes, sir? Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, that goes without saying. God knew her. God had it all figured out. But the Roman idea that Mary had been without sin and therefore uh, could be the, the mother of the Messiah is totally wrong. Totally wrong. It had nothing to do with Mary. All God was saying through Gabriel so far, so far, is, hey, you're a believer. In other words, you're, you're an actual gospel believer, not just a, not just a Jew or not just an Old Testament believer. You're a, you're a, you're a real authentic Bible believer. You're, you've got the thing down right. Okay? In other words, your parents or you know, whomever taught you correctly, and you're not trying to earn your way into heaven. That's all this means, folks. That's it. Nothing more. Don't, don't put anything more into it than it's already there. Okay? You have found favor with God. Now he goes on, and behold, and usually remember, behold always means, aha, this is, now comes a change. Now comes something new. Behold almost always introduces something new, or it emphasizes something that is unusual. Okay, so behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Wow, that's kind of all compressed, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's kind of all put together there. Um, Other, again, skeptics and critics, all right, will uh, say at this point, well, uh, this was uh, out of, this was very unusual for an angel to say, uh, how, how well did humans understand human biology? It's unknown. Remember that, that human biology, and especially anatomy, was, uh, uh, is a very recent science. Remember that in the ancient world, for you to cut up a dead body, or even cut into a living body, was verboten in most cases. It was forbidden. I mean, you could, you could clean up a wound if it was jagged and you wanted to clean it up. You could cut some off so that you could stitch it together. But cutting somebody open and, you know, looking around in there, that was verboten. You didn't do that. 
Matter of fact, you didn't do that all the way up until the time of the Renaissance and into the Renaissance. And still in the 14, 1500s, 1600s, it was illegal in Italy for you to cut open a dead body for any purpose whatsoever. Autopsies had to be done in secret. And anatomy lessons, if you will, had to be done in secret. You had, if you wanted to learn how the body ticked, so to speak, if you wanted to know where all the parts were, you had to do that on the sly. And you better not let anybody find out, because if they did find out, they put your little rear end in jail. And you might stay there for a long, 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 long time. The things that we take for granted, you know, that the, the big intestines here, the little intestines there, the stomach is here, the pancreas is here, the blah, 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 things we take advantage. You know, we take we, we just take for granted. They're in every biology book, all right. They did not know this. So a lot of critics will say, well, it's unusual for the angel to say this. You know, uh, maybe those old people in, the, those, in those days didn't really even understand what a womb was. Yeah, I don't buy that. I don't buy. That. Um, the ancients understood more than we give them credit for. Granted, they did have some spooky ideas. They did have some weird ideas about humors and things like that. But for the most part, when it came to the facts of life, how babies are made, the ancients knew what's going on here. They, they had the cause and effect down pretty well, all right? So I don't think this is, I don't think that's a, that's a fair criticism of the Bible. I don't think it's a fair criticism of Gabriel, that Gabriel uses the term womb here. I don't think so at all. And that's what it is in the Greek. Okay? And remember who's writing this, Luke is a doctor, he's a physician. And so he knows what he's talking about here. All right? So you're going to have a baby, basically. All right? And here's the name. I'm going to give you the name. In other words, you're going to have a baby, he's going to be a boy, and he's going to be... This Jesus guy, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. People, again, they start criticizing here. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. Ooh, that doesn't mean he is the Son of the Most High. Yeah, it does. Why will he be called the Son of the Most High? Because he is. <laughs> I mean, again, folks, the critics, you know, they're going to make this stuff up as they go along. Uh, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now remember, the Jews do understand one thing at this point in history. They're looking for another David. They're looking for the next David. They are looking for the son of David. They are looking for a Messiah in that sense. And they are looking for somebody to sit on a throne. And they do believe that the throne of David is eternal. That much they do. That much they understand. The throne of David is eternal. And they're just going through a bad stretch right now. They were run over by the Greeks, well, the Assyrians and the Greeks, the Egyptians and the Greeks. Then they were run over by the Romans. And they're kind of in a bad patch. They're kind of in a tough spot right now. But they believe, truly, truly believe, that their nation will become independent once again from Rome and any other power for that matter. And that the throne that will be a descendant of David on the throne they will bring back Israel to its glory of the David years and the Solomon years. And that that new kingdom, that new Israel, will last forever. Into eternity. Now you have to understand one other thing. A lot of the Jews by this time do not have a sense of what we would think of as heaven. Most of the Jews at this point in history have given up on things like heaven, paradise, resurrection, that kind of thing. A, a, a spiritual kind of thing. Most of the Jews at this point are only wanting and only expecting to have the nation of Israel, the political nation of Israel, independent once again and in glory once again. In other words, to be an empire once again. That's, that's what they're thinking. They're not thinking about going to heaven. As far as a lot of them concerned, when you're dead, you're dead. Now, some of them do believe that you'll be resurrected in a body and can live forever, but that's a minority. 
Most Jews today do not believe in the resurrection. They do not believe in a spiritual heaven. Most Jews today have denied that for a thousand years already. In other words, they're not big on pie in the sky, as they would say. The reason they do good, the reason they try to be, well, not even, they don't even use the terminology that we do to talk about saved. They don't talk about that. Okay? But the reason they do good, the reason they repent on uh, Yom Kippur, for example, the reason they, they want to uh, uh, atone for their sins, that is make, make good on things they've done wrong, has nothing to do with what we think of as salvation or what we think of as paradise or heaven or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. Okay? It's just this is the thing to do. It's simple as that. God puts you here on this earth to do good stuff. And if you do bad stuff, you're not being faithful to Him. There's no other payoff than that. That's it. And again, a minority do believe in the resurrection and all that, but that's a minority. So at this time in history, all right, at this time in history, they're only thinking about this idea of the throne. When, they hear, when, when Mary hears this throne, not, not Mary necessarily, but when anybody else would hear this idea about throne, that I'm going to give you, I'm giving you this guy, he's going to sit on the throne of David, they would all go, ah, yeah, that's what we're waiting for. Way to go. Now, of course, you and I know, and again, we've been told this since we were this big, you and I know that this is a spiritual sense and an eternal sense. But that's not, and, and I think Mary would understand that. And I, well, she shows that she does later on. But, but please, understand this again explains Jesus, the rejection of Jesus, for the most part, by his contemporaries. Because he did not fit the bill. He did not look like somebody sitting on a throne. And he did not do what it was necessary to sit on the throne. In other words, get rid of the Romans and lead a revolt or lead a great rebellion or, or, or lead a war to make his nation, Israel, or Judah, uh, 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 an empire. He didn't do that. That's why he was rejected. Okay? And it's, it's, not, it's not because of anything he did or didn't do necessarily himself, as much as it is the wrong perception that most of his contemporaries had at the time. Right? So uh, these things always keep in mind when you're hearing this, because it's really important Otherwise, we get kind of thinking too highly of ourselves. Oh, yeah, well, we wouldn't have done that. Yeah, uh, not, so, not, not so fast, my friends. Not so fast. Uh, this, this also, this, by the way, this also tells us how important it is when the teachers go astray. When the leaders of the church and the teachers of the church go astray, what happens? They lead all the people astray to the point that when God shows up, they're a bunch of ignoramuses. So, we'll give him the throne, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now, notice, he will reign over the house of Jacob. He doesn't use, he doesn't use the word Israel. He uses the word Jacob. In the Old Testament, the house of Jacob is differentiated between that, the house of Jacob, and the house of Israel. The house of Israel, remember, those were the ten tribes that got lost. Okay? Those were the ten tribes, we call them the lost ten tribes. So when he talks about Jacob here, what's he talking about? Again, he's talking about the remnant. And who are the remnant? Mary is a remnant. Joseph is a remnant. Okay? The remnant of those, the small number of those who still believe in the correct idea of the Messiah that the Messiah brings the gospel of salvation by grace alone through faith. That's the remnant, and that's always the remnant. We are the remnant today. The vast majority of church people today in the so-called Christian church, the vast majority of people in the world do not accept the gospel, the true gospel. Okay? We are a remnant, and that's the way it's always been. Abraham was a remnant of a... Noah was a remnant of a huge world. Eight people out of billions. Abraham was a remnant of his world. Isaac and Jacob were remnants. 
Jacob's family, the 70 who went into Egypt, were a remnant. Those that came out were a remnant. The ones that made it to the promised land were a remnant. And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. If you look at the Old Testament correctly, and look at the whole Bible correctly, what you will see is a small number of true believers amongst a sea of pagans, sea of unbelievers. That's what you will see. Yes, sir. You have the same thing going on in, in the rest of the world. Just like uh, you know, Hitler was just a small remnant to start out. Yeah. yeah, right. True. Now, now we get to another important point. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? How is that different from Zechariah. Remember? Zechariah said, how's that going to be? I'm an old man. My wife is an old man. We're way past the age of uh, having children. So how's this going to happen? And, then, and the angel strikes him dumb. Def uh, or dumb, anyway. Huh? And gets, ang gets angry with him. Let, let's, let's compare the two... Let's compare the two. For certain notices in italics, it's not there in the Greek. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the NASB people thought they'd play a fast one here, and they threw that in there. <laughs> Look at back at verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know this? That for certain doesn't belong there, folks. Just another reason why all translations are faulty in one way or another. This is a good example. They, the NSB people threw it in there figuring you're too stupid to figure out the difference between Zechariah and, and Mary. Okay? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. What does Mary say? How can this be? Now that's a good translation. Look at the words carefully now and don't pay any attention to the certain business. Just look at the words without the italic words. How will I know this? Or how can this be? How will I know this? Or how can this be? What's the difference? See if you can pick it, pick it out. Hmm? No problem. Same thing. How can this be? How shall this be? That's what Dale said. How do you mean? How will I know this? How can this be? How is one positive and the other negative? How will I know this? How can this be? Well, no, Zechariah is not pregnant. Oh, okay. That's okay. The how, can, the how can this be is the negative part of it because he doesn't no. believe that can happen. Yeah, right? I, I think it's positive because she says, how can this be? Explain it to me. Ah, okay. All right. I'm All right. But then he but says, how will I know this? this? Which means ah, what's the difference between saying to God, how, will, how, 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 how can I know this? What, what is it? Okay, let's, let's make it simple. One, the verb, the verb is know. How can I know this? As opposed to Mary saying, how can I, or how can this happen? How will I know this is going to happen? How can this happen? So she knows by, use, by using the verb know, then you are thinking this is probably going to happen, but I want to know how I'm going to know, right? You're close. You're real close. <laughs> You're real close. How will I know, or how even can I know? How, how, uh, how in other words, if I say, "How will I know this?" You can understand why the translations add what they do, because they want to say, they, they want to say, "How can I know this for sure?" Why? Because the knowing. What's what what's what's the knowing? What's the knowing have to do with this? Zechariah is therefore calling into question what. 
the actuality of what's going to happen. Okay? How will I know this? That's why they add, for sure or for certain. How do I know this is really going to be? Okay? So it has to do with knowing. In other words, real simple, folks, he doesn't believe. He doesn't believe. He wants to be convinced. He's not convinced yet. He wants to be convinced. Now, Mary, on the other hand, she's not talking about knowing and believing. As Bruce said, she wants to know the process. How can it happen to speak? How is this going to work out? I know all the birds and the bees, dear Gabriel. And I know what men and women do to make people pregnant. And how in the world am I supposed to get pregnant if I don't do that thing? That's what she's saying. She's not saying, I don't believe you. Zechariah is saying, I don't believe you. Prove it to me. Mary is saying, I believe you. Okay, okay, I believe you. But how are you going to work this? Well, she was scared because when he said that, she's thinking, I've got to make sure I pick the right guy. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> or, 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 or maybe, or maybe it's even more uh, crass than that. Maybe it's even more crude than that. She has to make herself ready to have sex with God. Well, I don't even think she's thinking that. Or the angel, maybe. Right. She's going to conceive a baby, but now I have to, I have to make sure that whoever I do it with is the one that God prefers. Yeah. I, I, I still think I still think she's probably thinking before that even she's still thinking I got to do it with God or I got to do it with this angel here that that's what I'm thinking but but you could be right too it puts a lot of pressure on her right but on the other hand is God going to tell her to do something uh, illegal? And for her to sex, have sex with anybody but Joseph, it would be illegal. She could have sex with Joseph all she wants. I mean, people, under, again, you have to understand this, all right? And maybe I should have, maybe I, should, I skipped that step. In the, Jewish, in the Jewish betrothal, okay, let me go back. In the Jewish betrothal, yes, it was expected that the betrothed couple would abstain from sexual relations until the husband was ready to bring the wife to his home and set up housekeeping. However, the Jews and uh, Moses in his law, if the two the betrothed did have sex, and let's say the woman became pregnant, it was not illegal. In other words, the child would not be a little gilliment and the betrothed husband would not be taken out and stoned. So, any uh, sexual relations between the betrothed couple during their betrothal was not considered out of bounds, was not considered out of line, was not considered wrong or sinful or evil. It was considered a breach of etiquette. It was considered not wise. It, it, was, it was considered not uncool. Wise. Yeah. It, yeah, it, 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 wouldn't, it wasn't considered wrong in the moral sense, in the ethical sense. It was considered wrong in the cultural sense. Like, I gave a paper one time on engagement and betrothal, um, and then um, how to apply it in our day, uh, in a con pastor's conference. <laughs> and I asked the question, and I caught him off guard, I think, a little bit. It was about... 50, 60 pastors, and I asked the question, how many of you, how many of you done a wedding in the last year? And just about all the hands went up. How many of you did a wedding where it was a first wedding? And most hands went up, like again, 30, 40 hands went up. How many of those first weddings did the bride wear white? All the hands went up. I said, now, how many of you actually believe that the bride was a virgin? And, and no, the guys, the guys all went like this, and like two or three hands went up. Okay, all right. So you know, my application was we shouldn't we shouldn't be too hard on couples uh, who maybe have sex before the wedding, but they're engaged. 
That's all I was saying. Oh, man, set off a firestorm. You, you think I would proclaim four members in the Trinity. Man, oh, we can't ever do that. We can't say that. Lock the doors and windows. Shut everything up. Don't let anybody hear what's going on in here. And I said, guys, we need to be honest with people. Give the Jews credit. They were honest. Okay? They knew eh, this was going to happen every once in a while. Uh, maybe it's going to happen a lot. I don't know. But they figured, eh, we're not going to worry about it. They're legal. They're as good as married. Okay? This is what Luther called in Luther's day. He used to talk about this all the time. And he would say this is that an engagement of betrothal is tantamount. That's the word he used, uh, or the English equivalent of the German word, was tantamount to marriage. And so Luther taught, don't criticize uh, these couples. Don't come down on them. I mean, tell them that, well, you know, if it's that hard to keep celibate, maybe they should move up the wedding day, you know. Instead of having be married next year, maybe they should get married next week. <laughs> you know, whatever. That's what Luther would say. But he wouldn't put it in the same category as moral sin. Okay? He wouldn't put it in the category of, of, of sinful relations. Okay? He wouldn't put it in the category of fornication or adultery. There you go. Okay? So, uh, what, that's what Mary's, Mary's confused about. Okay, what Mary's confused about is, okay, I'm going to be uh, the mother of this uh, David person, this Jesus person. Okay, how, how is that going to be? Uh, how, how are you going to work this out? All right, and, and so that's, that's the difference always, folks, between Zechariah and Mary. Zechariah does not believe. And you can just point to the word no. How will I know this? He doesn't know it. He doesn't. How will I know it? He doesn't know it now. In other words, he doesn't believe it now. Whereas in Mary's case, well, how are you going to pull this off? That's the difference, okay, between the two. All right. Uh, moving on, this is, the, this is the angel's answer. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, you and I, at this point, are going to yell time out, and we're going to say, whoa, now you're talking in riddles. How's the poor girl supposed to understand what this means? Ah, but she will. Okay. Uh, the how shall accepts, uh, indicates acceptance. All right. Um, it's not a question of unbelief. Right, okay, the how. Um, where did I make my note here? Uh, Jesus was immaculately conceived, so therefore he was the Son of God. The agency of the Holy Spirit is employed. Think of it at, as at creation. What did the Holy Spirit do at creation? And that's why there's two terms here, folks. Holy Spirit and Most High. What did the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit will come upon you Uh, he did the organizing, we like to say. Yes, he did the organizing. He moved on the face of the waters and organized things. Okay? He organized the molecules, if you will, into earth and water. Okay? Now, but again, why is there a difference between Holy Spirit and Most High? Who's the Most High? Well, who's the Holy Spirit? I uh, don't say that. He's not part of God. He is God. You could. The best thing always when you when you're tempted to say something like that, just say person of God, and you're you're okay. He was right? the organizer, and also made the event happen. Right. Well, Jesus actually no. Jesus actually made the event happen. Everything John says in his gospel, all that came into being, came into being by the Word. So the Word, Jesus Christ, caused things to happen. The Spirit, the, okay, the Father gives the order, the Son carries out the order, the Holy Spirit organizes what the Son brought into existence. Okay, if you want to see it that way as far as creation is concerned. Now, how does this apply then to the conception? Okay, now, now this is a problem for some people. If the Most High, is the Most High the whole Trinity? Or some would say Most High is the Father? Or is Most High the Son? 
or just the Son and the Father? It has to be the whole Trinity, huh? Okay. The, the, the problem people get into is if it becomes, if it, if it gets to the Most High being uh, um, El Elyon, which is in the Old Testament, okay, that's almost always uh, the whole Trinity, okay, the Most High. The most, the most high meaning the most mighty, the most almighty. Okay, so all three members of the Trinity. Well then, if that's the case, why does Gabriel then separate out the Holy Spirit and say him first and then say the other? This is a problem for some Christians. They, 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 they don't understand what Gabriel's saying here. Okay. Well, because back then they weren't really understanding the Trinity. Well, they certainly didn't use the term Trinity. Let me let me share with you. Let me share with you just a little something here. Make sure I got the right verse. Yeah, thirty-five. All right, thirty-five. Answering, the angel said to her, "The Holy Spirit, okay, which is always the way. It's a pneuma agion, which is spirit holy. It's always the way it said will come upon you." and the power, dunamis, of the hipstone okay, will overshadow you. All right? So the idea is that you've got the Spirit really bringing, or maybe I, the idea would be introducing, I suppose, injecting. It's a little squeamish there, but... Let's use that. The Holy Spirit is the channel. Just like the Holy Spirit was the channel for the, um, uh, the, the uh, apostles at Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit comes with wind and little tongues of fire on the head. Okay? Now, is the whole Trinity involved in that? Of course. Absolutely. But there is the Holy Spirit coming with power. Okay. So think of it this way, that there's two steps involved in this process. There's a two-step process. The Holy Spirit comes in with power. Okay. What's this do with Mary? Mary's already a believer, so it's not, making, it's not converting Mary. There are some idiots out there that teach that. That's not the case. It's not converting Mary to believer. She's already a believer. She's already a Christian. She's already a believer and everything. She doesn't need to be converted. Okay? But the Holy Spirit, it's like if we pray for the Holy Spirit. What are we praying for? What are we praying for? If we pray, if we ask God in our prayers, God, send the Holy Spirit on me with power. What are we praying for? Increasing birth. Increasing faith. Courage. Wisdom. Knowledge. Okay? Like when I, before I go up uh, to, to the pulpit to, to pray, uh, to, uh, to preach, okay? Give me power. Give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. Help me remember my sermon, okay? Um, you know? You're, 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 it, it's, the, it's the conduit. Maybe that's a better the word than insertion. <laughs> it's the conduit. Okay, that's the first thing that happens, the conduit. God sends the Holy Spirit into her with power. So she has increase in faith, increase in wisdom, increase in knowledge, uh, increase in uh, courage, um, you name it. Okay? So that's the first thing. So that's call that the preparatory move. Okay? Call it, if you will, I've heard it this way, that the Holy Spirit is nesting in Mary, preparing her body and her soul to care for the Messiah. Just as a pregnant woman goes about the house nesting, you know, doing all kinds of things in order to, to be prepared for the baby, right? Nesting. Okay? Now then the second thing that happens, and then the Almighty, this is all three members of the Trinity. This is all of God. This is the powerful, powerful God. This is the El Shaddai, the El Yayon, okay? The big guy, the big kahuna. Overshadow. Ooh. What, 
What, what, does, that, what does that make you think of? That's rather weak. Overshadow. Overshadow. What happens? He's covering. Ah, covering? Take control. Oh, I like that. I like that. Take control. Covering. Okay. Overshadowing. Overshadowing. Okay. Taking over. Okay. Yeah. Taking over. All right. Um, um, think of it. Uh, think of it like. Uh, uh, think of it like a bird. Okay. One of the pictures that the Old Testament likes to use all the time is uh, gathered between, be, beneath the eagle's wings. Huh? Well, what happens if you're if you're overshadowed by the eagle's wings? You're being protected. You're ah, you're being protected. protected. Okay, so that you can live. So think of the overshadowing as making to live. Huh? Making to live. If you're not overshadowed, then you're fair game for the chicken hawks. Huh? You're fair game for the red-tailed hawks. You're fair game for the falcons. You're fair game for the eagles. You're fair game for anybody that wants to pick you off. But if you're overshadowed, you can live, huh? Or in this case, come to life. Huh? Huh? See, see, see. So, step one: preparation. Prepare Mary. Give her a great deal of strength, wisdom, courage. Da da da. Well, all this stuff. Step two: bring life about. Create life within her. Okay. So now, in in biological terms. Okay, uh, we, ha we will say uh, Mary was fertile at this point in her life, so she's menstruating, and she has an egg that is in the right spot to be, con to be uh, 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 impl implanted, okay? So that, that those, everything, is, everything is good. <laughs> it, to paraphrase Paul, when the time was just right, <laughs> okay, so she's fertile myrtle at this particular point in her life, at this point in her monthly cycle. She's as fertile as she's going to get. Okay? And so what does God do? Well, here you get a little bit of uh, controversy. Uh, some side, some, one side says God created a spermazoa out of thin air, just created it, and had it... Uh, uh, conceive the, the uh, ovum, or the uh, uh, egg, right? Uh, others say, no, uh, God changed something, not sure what, uh, maybe another cell of some kind, or maybe another egg, we don't know, changed it into a spermazoa and had it uh, conceive uh, Jesus. Eh. I'm not sure it really matters. You see, there's some purists out there, some characters, if you'll let me finish this one point. There are some characters out there who are real big on this. Jesus finished, cre or God finished creation on the sixth day. And they're real big on this thing that God doesn't create anymore. They are really big on this word finished. Okay. Well, okay, if you... If you take that line of thinking, Jesus said on the cross, it's finished. Does that mean everybody goes to heaven? No, it doesn't, does it? In time, people still have to be born. They still have to come to faith. Still have to hang on to that faith until they die, right? So in God's time, in eternity, is the plan of salvation finished? Yes, of course it is. As far as your sin is concerned, is it all paid off? Yes, it is. However, in time, it's not finished yet. It's not finished yet. You still have to die, or Jesus has to come back, one or the other. Okay? So, you can say, well, all right, God said it's finished. I'm done creating. But there will still be a little creating going on from time to time. Eh? 
right? I don't think we should get hung up on that. Whether God created a spermazoa out of nothing, out of thin air, or whether he changed something in Mary is really not that important. What's important is God did it. So that what is conceived in Mary is divine, is 100% true man, but also 100% true God at the same time. Huh? Oh my goodness, we didn't get very far, did we? Oh well. There's a lot of information. Yeah, that's the thing with these little stories. They're, they're, they're chock full of stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, real quick. Uh, that's the reason why the child will be called the Son of God. Uh, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age, and she who is barren is now in her sixth month. So uh, uh, what Gabriel is saying, that's a different kind of miracle, true, making it possible for both Elizabeth and Zacharias to uh, be sexually... Uh, productive again. That that's a different miracle than uh, immaculate conception or the uh, virgin virgin conception. But it's a miracle. That it, it's a different miracle, but it's still a miracle. And so that's why he says, "And nothing will be impossible with God." And Mary said, "Behold, I am uh, I am the bond slave, or I am the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word." And if you're going to pinpoint a moment of Jesus' conception, I think you can use that. Some uh, people would like to use the overshadow part, but the angel is still speaking, this is going to happen. Now, this does not mean that Mary makes it possible for Jesus to be conceived, and therefore Mary is uh, half responsible. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that Mary's acquiescence created Jesus. This is what the Romans say. That's, for, that's why the Romans say Mary is the mother of God. And that's why Mary is the co-redeemer or a co-redemptrix. Because she, without her, without her assent, without her agreement, Jesus would not come into being. What if Mary had said, Are you kidding me? Get out of here! What would have happened? They found another Mary or another Ruth or you know who knows what. But yeah, uh, uh, so no, it doesn't depend upon Mary. But uh, uh, we can still say that when Mary says, "Let it be done to me," let it be, let it happen, that it happens. And again, that does not mean Mary is responsible. That does not mean Mary is the one who actually creates Jesus. No. God creates Jesus. But yes, Mary's acquiescence is obviously necessary. And why did she acquiesce? Because, remember, the Holy Spirit entered her in power and gave her the courage to do that. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Okay? All right? All right. We're done. Questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am. You were talking about the womb. There was a couple other times where the womb was pictured in the Old Testament. Uh -huh. Yeah. They knew what uh, yeah. I, 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 again, I give them credit. You know, yeah. come on. They're not, they're not as stupid as people I would like them to be for some reason. All right. See you in the morning. <laughs>